Disappearances in general are terrifying. How can someone just disappear without a trace and never be found again? It just doesn't make any sense. Humans can solve huge mathematical equations and take photographs trillions of miles away. Yet, oftentimes, we cannot even solve the disappearance of a human being here on Earth. Well, here are five of the strangest and most mysterious missing person cases in the world that are still unsolved, because all we have to base a conclusion on is a few seconds of grainy CCTV footage. Stephen Kosher The disappearance of Stephen Kosher is a mystery that's had a lot of speculation over the years, but researchers are still no closer to knowing what happened to him since the day he vanished. Stephen was 30 years old at the time and living in St. George, Utah. He was a devoted churchgoer and had never been in any trouble, but he was, however, unemployed and struggling to find work, which was causing him to fall behind on rent. Then, on the 13th of December 2009, he drove his car to Nevada, parked it randomly in a cul-de-sac in a wealthy retirement community in the town of Henderson, and has never been seen since. When police started their investigation, they found out that en route to Nevada, Stephen had tried visiting a female friend who was out at the time, and had also made several phone calls to church members during his journey, but gave no reason for his spontaneous road trip. After searching his abandoned car, his mobile phone, wallet, and keys were missing, but police found wrapped Christmas presents that were for his family, and what appeared to be overnight belongings, such as pillows, toiletries, and extra clothes. Four days later, his family were informed, and they had no clues or indications as to why he would just disappear. Then, some CCTV footage was found that was taken on the day Stephen disappeared. It was captured by a local homeowner and shows Stephen's car and later him walking past the camera with something in his hand. Take a look. There has been some speculation that the man caught on CCTV is not Stephen, but his family are confident that it is. So what happened to him and where did he go? One theory is that he fled to Nevada in hopes of starting a new life, although despite his financial trouble, his family said he was in good spirits and would not have left without telling anyone. Also, when a search of his home was conducted, nothing was found to suggest that he was planning to leave and not return. To add a little more mystery to the case, Stephen's mobile phone activity revealed that around five hours after he was last seen, his phone signal was picked up seven miles north from where his car was abandoned. And the day after, someone, presumably Stephen, checked his phone for voicemails at six in the morning at Whitney Ranch in Henderson. His phone signal remained there for two days until his phone ping stopped and nothing more has been picked up. Stephen Kosher has now been missing for six years, and despite there being several reported sightings of him over the years, nothing has led to his whereabouts, and his mysterious disappearance continues to be unsolved. 24-year-old Jennifer Kessie was a bright young woman who had everything to live for. She had just returned home from a holiday with her boyfriend, had moved into a new apartment, and had just been promoted at work. So when she disappeared without a trace, and some mysterious CCTV footage was released, her family were convinced someone had abducted her. Jennifer was last seen at around 6pm on the 23rd of January 2006, when she finished work at Westgate Resort in Ocoee, Florida. She kept in regular contact with her family and boyfriend that evening and made several calls, the last being at around 10pm to her boyfriend. The next morning, Jennifer did not call or text her boyfriend like she did every morning, and when she didn't arrive at work and her phone kept going to voicemail, people started to get concerned. Her parents were informed and they drove two hours from their home to their daughter's apartment to see if she was okay. When they arrived, her car was gone and the inside of her apartment was untouched. There was no sign of forced entry and was evidence that she had been there that morning, as a towel was wet and her clothes were laid out ready for work, suggesting she was either picking the right clothes to wear that morning by laying them out, or that something happened before she had a chance to get changed for work. The police initially thought that she had had a fight with her boyfriend and would turn up later on, but after ruling that out, a search was conducted. A canine unit tracked her scent from the apartment to the parking lot, suggesting she went missing as she was leaving for work. Then a major piece of evidence came up. 
After seeing Jennifer's car on the news, a resident of a nearby complex contacted police and said a car matching the description of Jennifer's had been parked outside for several days. The car was in fact Jennifer's and is believed to have been wiped down before being left, as only a small fibre of DNA and a lateral print was found inside. The police then checked the surveillance footage of that area and it shows a person parking the car and walking away. The CCTV camera only took a shot every three seconds and it's a complete fluke that the person of interest's face is hidden in both the shots. The footage is the only lead that we have, and after FBI analysed it, due to its bad quality, they were unable to establish the gender of the person. Although they are believed to be between 5 foot 3 and 5 foot 5, and could possibly be wearing a cricket uniform when looking at a comparison. The footage was enough to convince Jennifer's family and the police that foul play was involved, but no more information has been gathered. Jennifer's family have and never will give up their search, and are pleading with the public for information to help them solve the case. If you have any information or a liable theory, then there are details in the description of how you can help out. Christina Morris On August 29, 2014, at around 11.20pm, 24-year-old Enrique Orochi parks his car in the Legacy Shopping Mall car park in Piano, Texas. Shortly after, 23-year-old Christina Morris, who lived around 50 miles away but was visiting a friend, also parks her car in the same car park. At around 3.30am, Christina and Enrique leave at the same time and make their way back to their cars. At 3.55am, Christina and Enrique can be seen on CCTV entering the car park. They then apparently split up to go to their cars, and three minutes later, Enrique is seen driving away. But Christina's car does not leave, and she has never been seen since. Christina, who lived with her boyfriend, had been texting him throughout the evening, but for some reason he did not report her missing for four days and she was only reported missing when she did not turn up for work. The search began, and despite her boyfriend being a possible suspect because he did not report Christina missing, and apparently had 15 missed calls from her on the night of the incident, it's believed that he did not have any part in her disappearance, as he's been working closely with police and search teams to help out. The next suspect was her high school acquaintance, Enrique Orochi, who was seen walking with her on the night she disappeared. He had turned up three hours late for work on the morning Christina was last seen, and his workers reported seeing a bite mark on his arm. He also initially lied to police about where his car was parked and was captured on camera cleaning the boot of his car after Morris's disappearance. When more research was done on him, it was found that he had wiped his mobile phone before police confiscated it, and Christina's DNA was found in a vacuum cleaner that he had used to clean his car. All of this was more than enough for Enrique to be arrested and he is set to go on trial sometime in 2016. So what could have happened to her? It's possible that Enrique did kidnap her and drive off with her in the boot, but maybe something else happened, and like he says, he didn't have any involvement. Christina's family continue to search for her and want to keep her disappearance in the public eye, in hopes of gathering more information about what exactly happened in that car park. Lars Matank The story of Lars Matank has been talked about a lot because nothing adds up and the entire case is a mystery. But I am including it because I've done some serious digging and can hopefully bring new information that we can all try and piece together. On June 30th, 2014, Lars Mitank travelled from his home in Berlin to Varma, Bulgaria for a holiday with his friends. Whilst attending a party on the beach, he got into a scuffle with rival football fans and as a result ended up with an injury to his ear. During that night, his friends say he was acting strange and disappeared. When he turned up the next morning, he told them that he had got into another fight with football fans and they had paid someone to beat him up. His friends said they did not believe this story, but didn't think much of it. After this, Mitank went to the doctor because his ear was hurting and the doctor diagnosed a ruptured eardrum and prescribed antibiotics. He was scheduled to fly home on the 7th of July with his friends, but decided to postpone his flight until his ear was better, as he did not want to risk hurting himself anymore. Contrary to what most people say, the doctor said he could fly, but he chose not to. He convinced his friends he would be fine and they carried on with their planned flight and left Lars in Bulgaria, where he checked into a cheap hotel room. After just one night alone, he started to panic and texted his mother telling her he felt unsafe and scared, and for some reason told her to cancel his credit card. 
He then left the hotel and rang his mother to tell her that four men were following him and that he was hiding. He then hung up and texted her, what is Cefiroxime 500, which was the antibiotic he had been prescribed by the doctor for his ear. It's believed that Mitank hid in the streets that night before visiting the airport doctor in the morning to see if his ear was better and if he was able to fly home safely without further injury. This is where the CCTV footage comes in. He can be seen on the camera walking towards the doctor's office with all his luggage. Then 46 minutes later, he frantically runs out of the airport without his bags. People outside the airport said they've seen him climb over a fence and disappear into the forest. And he's never been seen since. Take a look. After being interviewed, the doctor he visited reported that he had become very agitated when a construction worker entered the room during his consultation. His friends also revealed that after the fight, which seems to have sparked everything, he had become convinced that someone was trying to kill him. Lars had no history of mental illness and to this day there is no explanation for his actions. One theory is that he had some kind of mental breakdown after the fight and ran off into the woods as he thought someone was trying to kill him. Maybe the fight he had was with the wrong people and they were actually trying to kill him. And maybe the doctor told him that his ear was still damaged so he panicked and ran off. I don't know, it's a strange case. One truck driver did come forward and claimed that he had seen Lars hitchhiking in Bulgaria. But apart from this, there's not much more for us to go on. So what's your theories? Brian Schaefer on the evening of March the 31st, 2006, Ohio State University medical student Brian Schaefer met his father Randy for dinner to celebrate the beginning of spring break. After saying goodbye to his father, Brian met his friend at around 9pm at the Ugly Tuna Saluna restaurant and bar in Columbus, Ohio. He also called his girlfriend Alexis, who he had planned to go to Miami with in a couple of days. After the call, Brian and his friend visited several bars and had drinks before making their way back to the Ugly Tuna Saluna. By now, they had met up with another friend and the three carried on drinking at the bar. Whilst there, the intoxicated Brian separated from his friends and despite their repeated efforts to find him, they assumed that he had gone to his apartment. During the weekend, both his father and girlfriend tried to call him, but his phone went straight to voicemail and by Monday morning, he was reported missing. The police search for Brian focused on the Ugly Tuna Saluna and after reviewing security footage, he can be seen entering the bar at the escalator and then later he is seen talking outside to two young women before heading back inside. This is the last sighting of him and despite viewing the surveillance footage, there is no evidence that Brian left the area. There are only two main exits that he could have taken, down the escalator, which he was not seen on CCTV doing, or through the emergency exit, but this also has a camera and did not show anyone leaving that night. So what happened to him is thought that maybe he wanted to disappear, as his mother had just passed away and he had told his girlfriend a few days before his disappearance that she should move on and find someone else as he was struggling with his mum's death. There is speculation that his two friends know more than what they are revealing, especially because one of them did not want to take a lie detector test, although no hard evidence has linked them to the case. But maybe they helped him disappear and escape his problems. If so, how did he escape the bar without being seen on camera? Maybe he dressed up in disguise and left, or maybe, since the Ugly Tuna Saluna was undergoing some building renovation, he found an escape through where this was being done. This also brought up the theory that whilst drunk, he staggered into the construction site and fell into a pit that was scheduled to be concreted in, but surely he would have been seen by the workers. Some say he was murdered, but there is no evidence to suggest this. So what happened? It's now been 10 years since his disappearance, and in that time, there is still not a single trace of Brian or his whereabouts. So there's five mysterious disappearances that only have a little CCTV footage for us to use as clues. All of these cases were very hard to research because the thought that someone out there has some involvement in these is such an upsetting and frustrating thing to think about. Why anybody would want to take another human being away from their friends and family is beyond me, and my heart goes out to all of those affected by these disappearances. I've included some donation and support pages in the description for those involved if you would like to donate or offer any information. Because can you just imagine how incredible it would be if this video and the community could help shed some light on these unsolved cases?
Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week for another video.